Welcome to this YSL Lexel VBA tutorial. In this video, we'll look at how you can read and execute SQL query files using VBA. We'll start by looking at the scripting runtime object library and just remind you quickly how to use a file system object class. And we'll use that to open up a query file and read its contents into a string variable. We'll then look at passing that string into an ADO record set to execute a query and return its results. And we'll write those results out to a new Excel worksheet. We'll then move on and look at how we can use a file picker dialog box to make it easy for your end users to pick the query they want to run. We'll also explain how you can pick multiple files using a single dialog box and process the collection of files returned. We'll also show you how you can use a folder picker dialog box and then loop through the collection of files in the folder, testing the file type of each file to make sure we're only executing valid SQL queries. So quite a lot to do in this one. Let's get started. OK, to get started, there are a few things you'll need to do. First of all, you will need to grab a copy of the files I've created for this video. I'll stick a link in the video description so that you can download this folder. And when you've extracted that, you can take the files you'll find in there and stick them in an easy to reference folder ready for later on. I've created a simple folder called SQL queries, and I've stuck that in the root of my C drive and then just copied those files into there. As well as the files, you'll need to install an instance of SQL Server. So if you haven't already done that, we do have a couple of video series which explain exactly how. There's one for SQL Server 2017, uh, which explains how to install the developer edition, which is free. And that's the version that I'm going to be using for this video. There's also a slightly older series on SQL Server 2016, which explains essentially the same thing, but for the older version. It doesn't matter which version you use for this video. Both uh, versions will work in exactly the same way for what we're going to do. You will also need a copy of the YSL Movies database if you want to follow along with what I'm doing. So there's a video here in this series which explains how to install it and, um, and a bit of background information about it. You can go there to grab a script to install the database. And you'll also need a copy of the Microsoft OLEDB driver for SQL Server. Uh, this isn't included in the SQL Server installation, and this is the driver that I'm going to use in this video. It's a small download, about five megabytes. It takes just a couple of minutes to install. Um, so you'll need that as well if you want to follow along with exactly what I'm doing. Assuming you've got all that, then you will have a copy of Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio ready and waiting to go. You'll find that in your start menu or I pinned a, pinned a shortcut to it in my start menu. I've already started it running and I've connected to a local instance of SQL Server 2017, which is called SQL 2017 Training. And that's where I'm going to start actually doing something useful in this video. The first thing we're going to do then is write a new query in SQL Server Management Studio, save that as a separate file, and then write some VBA code to open and execute the query. So to get started with writing a new query in Management Studio, you can click the New Query button upon the toolbar up here, or press Ctrl and N on the keyboard if you prefer. That will give you a brand new blank query window eventually. When we write our query, it will be looking for uh, objects stored in whichever database you have selected in this drop down list up at the top here. So I want to make sure that the objects that our query looks for are stored in the movies database. So if I click on the drop down list here and choose movies, that will make sure that the query will look for items in the movies database. That's not the only way to control that, by the way, but it's just the simplest and easiest way to demonstrate in this video. I've already installed the movies database, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to select that item from the list. And if I expand my databases folder, you can see my movies database sitting in there. I'm just going to click back into the query window and then I can either I can zoom in so you can see what I'm doing here, either by using the zoom box at the bottom or even more simply by holding the control key and rolling the mouse wheel forwards to zoom in on the code. We're going to write a very, very basic select statement, so I'm not going to spend too much time explaining how this works. We do have an entire separate series about writing select statements and queries in SQL. So I'm going to start by saying select, followed by a blank line, actually, and I'm going to then write the word from. And following the word from, I'm going to refer to one of the tables in my movies database. If I'm not sure what tables I have available, I can expand the movies database followed by expanding the tables folder. And then I can see a list of all the tables I have available. So I'm going to go with the film table for now. I can refer to the film table by saying dbo.film, although the dbo part is optional. I don't need to specify the schema, but it, it is good practice to be precise about which schema your table belongs to. So I'm going to say dbo.film. 
Having done that, I can go back to my select list and then I can start writing out the names of the columns from that table I'm interested in. So for example, I might be interested in the title column. And again, if you're not sure what column names you have available, you can expand the film table in the Object Explorer window and then expand the columns folder to see which column names you, you have access to. After the title column, I'll type in a comma and then I'll say release date. And then let's also have the, let's have the Oscar nominations and another comma and the Oscar wins. I'd like to see maybe only the Oscar nominated films. So I'm going to add a where clause below the from clause and I can say where Oscar nominations is greater than zero. And then finally, I'd like to see my results sorted in a particular order. I'd like to see the one, the film with the most nominations sitting at the top of the list. So on the next line, I can say order by and then refer to Oscar nominations again. And then I want the uh, the biggest number to be at the top. So I want to sort this in descending order so I can enter the keyword DESC for descending. That's a very, very basic query. As I say, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time making uh, explaining how, how select statements work. There's a separate series on that if you're interested. For now, I'd just like to check that my query does indeed work. So I'm going to click the execute button or press the F5 key to run the query. And I'll see a list of results comes out at the bottom. Uh, apologies about the, uh, the the result at the top there. The, the, the one that received the most nominations is Titanic, unfortunately, but there we go. Um, anyway, this query, I want to save this query now as a separate file. So to save the query, I can just click the good old save button in the Management Studio application or press Control and S. I'm going to save this query into the same folder that I extracted my other queries to earlier. So I'm going to point to the root of my C drive and then look for my SQL queries folder. I can double click in there and then I can change the file name. I'm going to call it, let's call it nice and simply, my query. Nothing particularly complicated. And if I save that file, I can then close it down in SQL Server Management Studio. And then we can look at how to write some VBA code to open up that file. I'll start with a brand new blank workbook for this. So if I head into Excel and then head to the developer tab and open up the Visual Basic Editor, I can then insert a new module into my project and I can create a new quick subroutine called, what should we call this one? Let's call it Open Query File. Now the file that I've just saved, if I have a quick look back in my SQL queries folder, has got an extension of .sql and it's recognized as a Microsoft SQL Server query file. Now, although that sounds like a very specialized file type, it's really nothing more complicated than a basic text file. And if you really wanted to, you could open up your query file in a text editor such as Notepad. So if I right clicked on my query and then choose open with Notepad, I'll see that the query I've just written is just there in plain text. So if that's the case, we can rely on basic techniques in VBA to open up a text file, read its contents into a string variable, and then use that as the basis of our record set sources later on. So the technique we're going to use in this video relies on using the Microsoft scripting runtime object library. Let's head up to the tools menu and choose references and then set a couple of references to some extra libraries. A little later on, we'll be connecting to a SQL Server database and generating a record set. So while we're here, we might as well set a reference to the Microsoft ActiveX Data Objects 6.1 library. And then if we scroll down a little further, we can also set a reference to the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Library. This is the one that allows us to open up a text file and read its contents into a variable. So having checked those two boxes, I can click OK. And then let's start writing some code to open up that file. Now let's declare a variable which can hold a reference to a file system object. I'm going to call mine FSO as scripting.filesystemObject. If you're not quite sure what a file system object is, uh, you can kind of think of it in rough terms as like an invisible version of a Windows Explorer window. A file system object lets you do things like create and delete and move files and folders. So the sorts of things you can do in a Windows Explorer window. We'll need to create a new instance of that class. So let's say set FSO equals new scripting dot file system object. And then we'll need a variable which allows us to open up our text file or our query file. So let's declare another variable. I'll call this one ts as a scripting.textStream. 
We can then use a method of the file system object class to open up the text file or the query file by saying set ts equals fso dot and then use one of its wonderfully named methods. I think one of the great things about file system objects is that the names of its methods are just so clear. Um, so if I wanted to open a text file, I simply say open text file, and then I can open up some parentheses, and then I need to pass in the file name of the file that I want to open. Uh, I could just type this in, of course, but it's slightly more convenient to head back to the window in which I've stored my my query file. And then if I've selected it, I can simply click the copy path button, which copies the full path and name and extension of that file. I can then go back to the Visual Basic Editor and then just paste in what I've copied. And it even comes along with a set of double quotes. So I don't even have to type those in. Now, there are some extra optional parameters of the open text file method. If I type in a comma there, the in out or input output mode for reading. Uh, well, I want to read the contents of the file, so I don't need to set that. Create the file if it doesn't exist. Well, it clearly does exist because I've just pointed to it. And then format as tri-state. Uh, the format of the file is fine as it is. So rather than bothering with those extra optional parameters, I'll just close around brackets at that point and then hit enter. A little later on, um, after I've finished with the text file, I will want to close it. So while I'm here, I'll give myself a couple of blank lines and then say ts.close. Now, while the text file is open, I'd like to read its contents into a string variable. So to do that, let's declare another variable. Let's call this uh, something like query string as string. And then what I'm going to do is say query string, if I can spell that properly eventually, there we go, query string equals ts dot. And then I'd like to read the entire content of the file. And to do that, I can use the read all method. So that will read the entire contents of the text file into my query string variable. After I've closed down the text file, I can then maybe display the results of my query string variable. I could do it in the immediate window, or let's just do it with a simple message box at this point. I'll say message box followed by query string. Having done that, I'm just going to run this subroutine to see what happens. And I should see that my query that I've written now appears as a string of text on a message box. So there we go, we've extracted the contents of that file into a string variable. The next step then is to take that query string and use it to return a set of results that we can write out into a worksheet. To do that, let's create another subroutine. So I'll create a subroutine called get query results. And I'll create a parameter for this subroutine so that I can pass in the, the string of my query. Let's call this one SQL string as string. And I'll just capitalize the, uh, the letter L there. I, I won't be able to sleep tonight if I don't do that. So there we go, SQL string as string. Now what we need to do is declare a few variables associated with, with ActiveX data objects record sets and connections. So let's declare a variable first called CN as an adodb.connection. And I'll also declare rs as adodb.recordset. Now, the previous video in the series explained how to use connections and record sets in reasonable detail, so I won't go into too much detail right here and now. What I do need to do is set my connection variable to be an, equal to a new instance of the adodb.connection class. So I can say set cn equals new adodb.connection. I can then set the connection string property of this connection object by saying string equals, and then there are several bits of information I need to provide for my connection string. I'll break this up onto multiple lines using the uh, continuation characters, and very quickly I'll go through and I'll say provider equals ms oladb sql as the uh, provider name, followed by a semicolon, and then I'll concatenate that with the next part, which will be server. And the server name in my case will be uh, my local host. So I can type in local host, or I can shortcut that just to a full stop, followed by a backslash and then SQL 2017 training. Then a, a semicolon and close the double quotes and then concatenate that with another new line character. Then the database name, which is fairly straightforward. I can say database equals, and we know the database we want to use is simply called movies, followed by a semicolon. And then I can concatenate that with the final piece of information I need here, which is trusted connection. And I am going to be using my Windows credentials to connect to this um, instance of SQL Server. So I can set trusted connection equals yes.
I can then type in the semicolon and close the double quotes. And then just to test that the connection itself is going to work, I can say cn.open and then a few blank lines and say cn.close. Just to check that that part of the procedure works um, at this stage, I'm just going to comment out the, um, the parameter. So I'm going to type in a set of open and close double as open and close round brackets and then comment out the parameter and then if I just step through this procedure just to check that my connection will open and then close and as long as nothing appears to happen that's a good sign if something happens it usually means something's gone wrong so at that point I can then bring back my parameter get rid of the extra extra round brackets and then move on to working with the record set Now, after I've opened up the connection, I'd like to create a new instance of the record set class. So I can say set rs equals new adodb.recordset. And then there are a few properties of the record set that I can configure. So first of all, I can set the active connection of the record set to be equal to the connection I've just opened. I will then also want to set the record set's source and the record set's source will be equal to whatever string of text I've just passed in via this parameter. So if I say rs.source equals SQL string. There are a couple of other pr uh, properties of the record set I could choose to, to set, and I explained these in the previous video, but I can say rs.cursor type equals, and then the most efficient one to use is ad open forward only. We're only making a single pass through the record set. We don't need to jump around and search for records and work backwards at any stage. So forward only is the most efficient type to use. I can also say the rs.lock type equals ad lock read only. We're going, only going to read the contents of the record set. We're not going to attempt to modify it. Uh, again, these aren't necessary, but it's always nice to be explicit about things like this. Always show that you intended to do this rather than just allowed it to happen by accident. So having done that, we can then choose to open the record set. So I can say rs. And then I can say open. And then a little bit later on, I will want to say rs.close. And in between there, we'll write some code that will write out the contents of the record set into a worksheet. Just before we do that, I'd like to test that all this is working as intended. So at this point, I'm going to head back up to the open query file subroutine. And I'm just going to replace my message box call to, with a call to the get query results method. So I'm going to replace that with get query results. And then I'm going to pass the query string into the SQL string parameter. And then hopefully this will all work if I step through this entire thing using the F8 key. So I'll get my text file opened up and I'll read the contents and then close the text file and then pass the query string into my new get query results procedure. And then I'll create my connection, set the connection string and open the connection, create my record set, set its active connection and its source, cursor type and lock type. And again, at this point, when we hit rs.open, as long as nothing appears to happen, that's a good sign. We can then close the record set and then close the connection and end both subroutines. The next thing I'd like to do is write out the contents of the record set into a worksheet. And I'm going to make a separate subroutine to allow this to work. And we'll expand on this a little bit later on in the video. We'll keep it quite simple for now. But down at the bottom of the module, let me give myself a few extra blank lines here so it's easier to see what I'm doing. And then I can create a new subroutine called write results to sheet. And I must capitalize the letter R there. Otherwise, again, I won't sleep. So write results to sheet. I'll declare a parameter for this subroutine. And the parameter will be, um, I'll call it result set as an adodb.recordset. And then I can do some very, very basic things here. And what I'm going to do is create a brand new worksheet. I don't just want to write out the, uh, the results into sheet one. So I'll declare a variable called ws as worksheet. And then I'll set ws to be equal to worksheets.add. So that will both create a worksheet and return a reference to it, to my ws variable. Then I'd like to refer to, let's say, range A2 in the worksheet to write out the uh, the results of the record set. So I can say ws.range A2. Dot, and then I can use the copy from record set method. And the single compulsory parameter for that method is to pass in a reference to a record set. So I'm going to use my result set parameter name there. 
having done that, I'll just keep it simple for now, as I say, and, and that will be sufficient. All I'm going to do at this point is return to my previous routine, and in between opening and closing the record set, I'm going to call on the write result to sheet method and pass in the RS variable to my new result set parameter. OK, so a bit of a chain of, of procedures going on there. But if we head all the way back up to the top where we're opening our query file and I run this subroutine and then have a look back in Excel, you should see that I get a list of all the results from that query written out into a new worksheet. Now, you may remember from the previous video, this little bug or feature involved in the copy from record set method. When you write the results out into a brand newly created worksheet, it doesn't work quite as well as it should. For example, you don't get the date formats detected correctly. The, the dates are just shown as their underlying numeric value. Things go even more drastically wrong if we didn't have a worksheet selected in the first place. If we had a chart sheet selected, for example, we actually get a runtime error message. And I can quickly show you that if you like, although it's not, uh, not particularly exciting. If I create a new chart really simply, I can type in the number one into a cell here and then press F11 to create a new chart. And then if I head back to my Visual Basic Editor and run the open query file again, I get this runtime error dialog box. And confusingly, because the, the code has actually worked, if I switch back to Excel, you can see I've got my new worksheet with all the data written out, but it reports a failure um, because I had a chart sheet selected. It's all very odd. Anyway, I'm just going to click the end button here. And the simplest possible way to solve this, although it shouldn't be necessary, I admit, is to make sure that we have selected the worksheet that has just been added. Now. You probably know already that adding a worksheet makes the new worksheet the active sheet, but for some reason it's not, um, it doesn't work with the copy from record set method. So let's just say ws.select to force that to happen. And then if I switch back to Excel, let's just select the chart sheet again, just to prove that this is going to work. And then run the open query file subroutine again. No runtime error dialog box this time. If I switch back to Excel, it even detects the, uh, the date format of the results as well. We'll deal with tidying up the results set a little bit later on, so adding things like the column headings and um, making the columns the correct width. What I really want to concentrate on at this point is a better way to pick the file whose query I'd like to run. I don't just want to have to type in the exact query name each time. I'd like to provide a way for the user to select an SQL file, and that's the query that will be executed. A really simple way to make this work is to use a file picker dialog box. So if I return back to my open query file subroutine, I can declare a new variable in here. Let's, let's call this one fd as a file dialog. What I can then do is set fd to be equal to an application.file dialog. And then if I open some parentheses, I get a choice of four different options, although the first one is hidden underneath the tooltip there. I use the arrow keys to scroll through. So I've got a file picker and a folder picker, a file dialog open and a save as. Now the open and save as dialog boxes are the ones that you would see if you chose to open a file or save a file in Excel. Uh, they have uh, default actions associated with them to both open Excel workbooks or save Excel workbooks. Folder picker, as the name suggests, allows me to pick a folder. What I want to do here is pick a single file. So I'm going to select the MSO file dialog file picker. And if I then close the round brackets after that, to make this file picker appear on screen is incredibly simple. If I say fd.show, and then I just step through the procedure up to that point using the F8 key, I'll see when I set fd.show, it shows me a file picker dialog box. I'm not going to pick a file at this point because I haven't captured the result of it yet. It will be fairly pointless. But I could, in principle, navigate to the uh, the folder I selected, the, uh, the um, SQL queries folder, and select a, a query, and then click OK. Now, at this point, I'm just going to stop the procedure. I don't want to proceed. There's no point. So I'm just going to hit the reset button, then look at how we can both customize that file picker and capture the result of the file that we've selected. To capture the result of the file dialog, let's declare another variable which can hold a string. So I'm going to say something like dim query file path as string. And then after we've shown the file dialog, Assuming that we selected an item in it, we'll return a selected items collection. So what we can do here is say query file path and then make that equal to the file dialog dot selected items. And then because it's 
possible that we could select more than one file in a dialog box, we have to refer to the index number of the one we want. We're going to configure our dialog box to only allow a single object to be selected, but for now we still have to specify what index number we, we need to return. So we need to refer to index number 1. The collection is indexed from 1 uh, in this dialog box. So having done that, what I should now be able to do is replace my open text file method where I've previously passed in a specific file and folder path. I can replace that with my query file path variable. So if I just run this one again now, if I run the entire subroutine, I'll pick a different query this time, just so we can see that we get a different list. Let's go for the actor roles query. If I select file number three there, if I click OK, and then look back at Excel and see the results. You can see I've got a completely different set of results here. So it's detecting the name of the file or the path of the file that I've picked from my file dialog. Next, we should deal with what happens if we don't select an item from the dialog box. If we run the subroutine again and then either click cancel or simply close down the dialog box entirely, we end up with a runtime error. And it's no great surprise that if we click the debug button, it's the line which tries to read the selected item when we haven't selected anything at all. So to make this work properly, what we should do is check the result of the show method. Now, that if I just reset the subroutine at that point, the show method returns a number indicating whether you selected uh, a file and clicked OK, or whether you just closed the dialog box down or cancelled it. So we can retrieve that number using a variable. Let's say, let's uh, capture the result in a variable. Let's call it FD result as integer and then we can say fd result equals fd.show. Now once that line has finished and we've uh, dealt with the dialog box itself we'll end up with one of two different numbers in fd result. If we have selected a file and clicked OK we'll have minus one. If we have cancelled or just closed the dialog box down we'll have zero. So that provides a nice convenient way to check if fd result equals zero then that means we've either cancelled or closed the dialog box, probably means that the user doesn't want to continue with the procedure. So let's just very quickly and simply say, then exit sub. So if I run the subroutine again now, and I click cancel or close the dialog box down, I don't get a runtime error, but the subroutine ends at that point. If I run the subroutine again, and I do select a file, let's pick my query again, and then click OK, the subroutine will run through to the end and produce a set of results for me. Now there are a few other basic things I can do to customize the file dialog before it's displayed on screen. So let's add a couple of extra lines in here. Uh, one simple thing we can do is set the initial folder path that the dialog box points to. If I say fd.initialfilename equals, and then I can simply point to the folder that I created earlier on, c colon backslash sql queries, followed by another backslash, and then regardless of which folder I had last looked at when the uh, the dialog box was last used, it will automatically return to the C SQL queries folder. I can also change the title of the dialog box. If I say fd.title equals, I could say pick a query to run. And then I could also change the button name as well. So I can say fd.button name equals uh, run a selected query. And then a couple of quick uh, changes I've made there. Nothing particularly important, mostly just cosmetic changes, but if I run the subroutine at that point, you can see that I've got a new title. I'm already pointing to the SQL queries folder, although that's the one that I was in last time anyway, so that isn't very obvious that that's happening. And then if I select a query, you'll notice the, the button currently says open, but if I do select a query, it now says run selected query instead. So it gives the user a bit more of a clue about what will happen when they click that button. Another thing we should consider is whether the user is allowed to select more than one file at a time in the dialog box. Now, it won't really make any difference as our code only looks at the first selected item anyway, but it could be a bit misleading if a user can run this subroutine and then select multiple files, which currently they can. So if I cancel this dialog box, we can set the dialog to only allow a single file selection by saying fd.allowMultiselect equals false. If I then run the subroutine again, if I try to drag a box around multiple files or I try to control and click or shift and click, I can find that I can only select one single file at a time. 
Another thing we should consider is what type of files can be selected in this dialog box. If I run the subroutine again, we'll see that the little filter in the bottom right hand corner here is set to all files, and that's the only filter available at this point. It doesn't matter too much because I've only put SQL query files in this folder, but if I navigated to a different folder entirely, let's say if I go to my PBI data folder here, here's a Power BI desktop file, a PBIX file. Now this is completely unusable in terms of uh, running an SQL query, but I could potentially select it and choose to run the selected query. So what we'll do is we'll replace the all files filter with a filter that only allows .sql files. I'll cancel that dialog box for the moment. And then before I show the, the dialog box, what we can do is first of all, clear all the existing filters. So I'll say fd.filters.clear. I can then add a new filter by saying fd.filters.add. And then I can set a description for my file filter. So let's call this one SQL queries. And then the extensions, if I type in a comma, I can set the extension to be asterisk.sql. So that's any file name with a .sql extension. So having done that now, if I run the subroutine again, I'll find that I've got my only available filter set, the all files filter has disappeared. So I can clearly see SQL files in this folder. If I navigate back to the other folder I just pointed to, PBI data, I'll see that I can't find any files that aren't .sql files in that folder. Now, although we've just set the allow multi-select property to false, meaning we can only select a single file, what if we did want to allow the user to select more than one file at a time? Let's change that property so it's back to true, so we can select multiple files. What we can do then is modify our code to loop through the selected items collection. There's a couple of ways we could do this. We could use a, a, an integer variable and count through the collection. Alternatively, we could just change the type of variable that query file path uses. So rather than setting uh, or declaring query file path as a string, we can declare it as a variant instead. And that allows us to use it in essentially a for each loop, to use a for each loop to essentially process an array. So what we can do here is modify the code after we've determined whether we've selected at least one file, we can say for each query file path in fd.selectedItems and then remove the reference to a specific uh, indexed item in that collection. I don't want to create a new instance of a file system object each time I go through this loop. So I'm just going to move this line above my for each loop and just space it out so we can see what's going on a little more clearly. I do want to set my text stream to be uh, equal to an open uh, text file using the query file path. And then I want to set the query string to be the contents of that text stream. And then I want to close the text stream and then pass the query string into the get query results. So I'm just going to group those four lines together by selecting them and then indenting them with the tab key. And then at the end of that, I can simply say next query file path. Okay, so we've got a basic for each loop now that loops through all of the selected items. If I just switch back to Excel briefly, and I'm just going to delete all of the extra worksheets here, everything except for sheet one, just so we can see that this is going to work properly. And then back to the Visual Basic Editor, and then I can run my open query file subroutine. And I will select more than one file. Let's select uh, one, two, and three. And then if I click Run Selected Query, I suppose we should change that to Run Selected Queries. But if I click that button, I ought to end up now with three separate worksheets. If I look back at Excel, I've got one for my uh, Actors Query, one for my Film Long Films Query, and another one for my original uh, Oscar-nominated films or Oscar-winning films query. If selecting individual files feels like a bit too much effort, we could modify the code even further to allow the user to select a single folder and then to have our code loop through all of the files in that folder, executing the query for each one that it finds. To make this work, I think we'll create a completely separate subroutine. Let's copy the open query file subroutine altogether and then paste it back in right at the top of this entire module. We'll then change the name of this one, so we'll call it uh, Open Query Folder, let's say, rather than Open Query File. 
we will change a couple of things in here. Let's set our file dialog at this point to uh, be not a file dialog file picker. We'll make it into an MSO file dialog folder picker instead. We can still set the initial file name there to point to a particular folder. Um, what I'm going to do at this point though is I'm just going to set it back to the root of my C drive there. So I'm going to say C colon backslash. I can change the title, let's say uh, pick a folder of queries to run and then change the button name so it says run queries in this folder and then the allow multi select has no effect with a folder picker, you can only ever select one item with a folder picker so we can remove that line altogether. Uh, a folder picker dialog box doesn't have filters either, so we can remove the two lines related to applying filters. We can still check the result of the file dialog, and if it's zero, then we can exit the subroutine. Then we've got a file system object variable, which creates a new instance of a file system object class. We need to change the way our loop works here as well, and um, because we're not returning a, a set of strings in an array, we're returning a reference to a, uh, or we're, we're returning the path of a folder that we've selected as a string. So what we would want to do is use that folder path to get a reference to a scripting folder object. Let's declare a new variable somewhere up here at the top after I've declared my file system object variable. Let's say dim fol as scripting.folder. What I can do with that then, after I've created my new file system object, is I can say set fol equals fso.getfolder. So this is used to get a reference to a folder object. And I need to pass in the path of the folder whose reference I want to get. And that's going to be stored in fd.selectedItems and you guessed it, number one. So having done that, I've now got access to the files collection of that folder. Let's declare another variable at the top up here. So after dim fol, let's say dim f as a scripting.file. And then I can change my for each loop to say for each f in not fd.selectedItems, but fol.files. I'll then change the next statement so it says next f as well. Then I can say set ts equals fso.open text file, but not query file path. I don't really need that variable at all anymore. I can simply refer to the path of my file object held in this variable here called f. So I can say f.path. The path property returns a full file name and folder path and the file name extension. Then I can use my query string to read the contents of that text stream and then close the text stream and then call on my get query results method just as we did last time. One other small issue we might consider here is that if you have a mix of different file types in the folder, currently there's no control over which files it will, it will try to pass into the get query results procedure. So what we could also do is check if the uh, the file name extension is not SQL. So we could say, let's say if fso.getExtension name, and then we can pass in f.path to that. And then we can say if that is equal to SQL, then. Now we should be slightly careful about this. Um, when we compare strings in VBA, the comparisons are case sensitive. So we should make sure that we're, that we're comparing our strings case for case. So a couple of quick ways we could do that. A simple way to do this here would be to say L case to convert the, uh, the file path into a lowercase string or the, 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 the extension name returned as a lowercase string and then compare that against a lowercase string here as well. So if I just then uh, indent those four lines again and then say end if, that will be one quick, simple, convenient way to, uh, to limit the files we uh, actually process. So having done that, um, we could get rid of the query file path variable up here. Let's delete that entirely. And then we can run this subroutine and we'll find this time we get to pick a folder rather than a file. If I go to my um, my SQL queries folder here, if I double click into there, you'll see we don't get a chance to select any files at all. I can only pick folders. So if I select my SQL queries folder and then choose run queries in this folder, we'll end up with another four worksheets this time, uh, one for each of those extra 
one for each of the queries stored in that folder. Okay, for the last part of the video, I'm just going to quickly tidy up the write results to sheet subroutine. So we get the results out in a fairly basic fashion at this point, but we don't get the column widths set correctly. We don't get the column headings. So let's just do a little bit of tidying up in that procedure to make the results look a little bit neater. Uh, let's see, let's get the column headings out first of all. There's a couple of different techniques we can use to do this. I described a couple of techniques in the previous video. What we want to be able to do basically is loop through the uh, the fields collection of our record set. So what we're going to do is declare a variable. We'll count through it this time. I'll declare a variable called i as integer. And then what we can do is after we've selected the worksheet, but before we copy everything from the record set, we can say for i equals zero to result set, result set dot fields. Sorry, I'll get that spelled correctly. Fields dot count. I also need then to subtract one from the count. Uh, the fields collection is indexed from zero rather than indexed from one. So we need to loop from an index number of zero to uh, one less than the count of fields in the collection. We can then say next i. And then what we can do is say ws.cells and then refer to the row number as one and the column index to be one more than the value of i. Um, i will begin at zero and there is no column number zero in a worksheet. So we need to say i plus one dot value equals and then we can say result set dot fields i. And then we can refer to the name property to retrieve the name of the field and that will write out the column headings into the worksheet. The other couple of quick things we can do here as well, we can make sure that after we've copied all the results into the worksheet, we can change all the column widths to be the correct width. So let's just quickly say ws.range a1, so that's the top left hand corner of all the results. Then I can refer to the current region property to return the range in which the cell sits. So that's everything up to the next completely blank row and column. Then I can say entire column. And then I can refer to the auto fit method to change all the column widths to be as wide as they need to be to display the results. OK, so having done that, let me just quickly switch back into uh, into the workbook and remove all of those extra worksheets again so I can select uh, the last sheet and everything except for sheet one. Right click and delete. We could have written a subroutine to do that as well, I suppose. And then let's head back up to one of our other subroutines. Let's go for the one that we, allows us to pick uh, a number of files. So if I head back to the open query file subroutine and run that one, let's just pick the first three again and then run these selected queries. And then if I switch back to Excel this time, we'll see a much neater set of results here. So we've got the column headings listed out and all the columns are the correct width to display the data we want to see. OK, well, I think that's about as far as I'd like to go myself with this video. I'm sure there's plenty more scope for tidying things up yet further. For instance, applying formatting to the column headings, maybe changing the worksheet names, maybe even including the text of the query string in your result worksheet so the user can see how the results have been generated. But all those are fairly straightforward, simple things to do. And I'm sure you can uh, you can work out how to do, do those things yourself. So I hope you found that one useful. It's nice to put a few different techniques together to create almost a complete working system, I suppose, a bit of uh, looping through files and folders, a bit of file picking, and of course, the main core part of this, executing an SQL query to return a result set to a record set, and then writing that set of results to a worksheet. So hope you found that one useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time.